Ah, oh, g'day. Welcome to Farming Live Australia. This is the second video and the last in the videos I'm doing about chainsaws for new chums. And this one's more about the actual practice of cutting, using wedges, sharpening your saw, all the practical things you need to know and do to actually cut with your chainsaw. Before we actually start the chainsaw, I'll just show you the gear that I always have with me when I'm going to do some chainsawing. It means that it saves me having to go back to the shed if something goes wrong. So the first thing is some sort of spanner to adjust your chain and bar and at a minimum one of these universal ones with a screwdriver on it. Some sort of a axe or tommy hawk. I usually just keep this tommy hawk in the car but I like a half axe if I'm serious. You will need a variety of wedges. You get away with a couple if that's all you want to own. The reason that plastic wedges are so popular is because if you hit the chain and bar with them, it doesn't destroy your chain. This is a vice to hold your chainsaw out in the paddock if you want to sharpen your saw with a file. And what you do is drive this into a stump and then you can hold your chainsaw. I will show you how that works. This gadget here is to dress your bar and keep it nice and square so your chain runs true. This is another spanner that I picked up from Jono and Jono and what it is is a universal one and it just about fits everything on your chainsaw. It has tube spanners for your bar and for your spark plug etc. A gauge so you can check what size file you've got. On one end it's got all the allen keys that fit your chainsaw and these are common to most chainsaws. It's got little screwdrivers to adjust your car breader and a raker hook to clean all the sawdust out of your chain bar. It also has a few other little spanners that will fit most common sizes on chainsaws and the whole thing folds up and it goes in a little pouch. The pouch has a loop that can go on your belt and if you're just going down the paddock to cut a little bit of firewood or something, you know, it's really easy just to put that on your belt and you don't have it to have a whole heap of stuff. This chainsaw sharpening kit comes from Jono and Jono and it has its own little pouch and you just roll everything up and keep it in there and keep it all together. That covers most of the gear that I think you sort of need to go out in the paddock if you're fairly serious. Sure, if you're just going out to cut one thing or something, you probably don't need all that. But when I go out, I always have that gear in the ute. Well, now I get on to actually using the chainsaw. The first thing is, of course, starting the chainsaw. At this stage, you really need to have good control over your saw and have it firmly held by the handles. Obviously, one hand is going to be used to pull start the saw. So you really only have one hand, so you have to secure the back end of the saw somehow and what I'm showing you now is a definite no-no. I think the preferred method nowadays is to put the saw on the ground and put your boot through the handle to start it. The reason I don't do that is because I'm old and fat and my back hurts and I find it very uncomfortable to do that. So what I do is the back handle I secure in the corner of my leg. After I start the saw, I always check by running the chain near a piece of timber that there's oil coming out the bar. I'm going to fell this little tree. The main trunk is only about 9 inches and you can see it has quite a lean up to the right hand side of the screen and also you'll see it's got some branches up in the air and we have to take the weight of those branches into consideration and also the direction of the wind is from this way and it's quite strong. I'm going to want to fall the tree that way. In case I need it I've got a, the wedge and the tommy hawk handy. Because the tree's so small and it's got such a big lean I don't think I'll need it but if I get into trouble I'd rather be looking at it than looking for it. You can see I've cut a scarf out of the side where I want the tree to fall and that's the way the tree is leaning. Now I will cut on the other side of the tree well above where I've cut that V-shaped scarf out. You'll see here I'm making a mark a good couple of inches above that scarf and that's where I'd sort of like to cut. The reason that I cut above my scarf with the final cut is to form a step in the trunk so the tree can't come back and hit me if it slips backwards at the bottom. 
The first thing I'll do is just take a few of these little limbs off. One thing you don't want to do with a chainsaw, especially on this lighter stuff, or at, or at all in fact, is just use half revs or something because it's light. When you slow the chain down, it's more likely to lock into the timber and drag your saw towards your timber instead of cutting and this can cause a dangerous situation. So always when cutting use high revs. Another very important thing to do as you're moving around the tree when you're doing this sort of thing is have a good look on the ground and be careful where you step. You wind up rolling your ankle and going arse overhead and before you know it you've got a running chainsaw on your hand and you're lying on the ground. You can see here it wouldn't be real hard to wind up tangling your legs up and falling over. Normally what I do if we're in this situation is I've got my wife with me and she picks up sticks and stuff and we would clean up a bit as we go so there's not so much stuff laying on the ground. When cutting you always have to be aware which way you cut up or down so as you do not jam the bar. The tip of your bar where the chain's revolving quickly if you touch it on something it will travel up and do what they call a kickback. I'll just explain a little bit about kickback. Where I've got my finger now that quadrant of the saw tip is really dangerous. Down the bottom here where I'm pointing is a lot safer and likely to pull the saw in not flick it up. Quite often for mortising posts I put the bar straight in like I am here and you'll notice to start with I've always got downhill on the saw end. This helps with kickback however if you push it in and the top tip end of the bar comes into contact with the wood it will usually kick back. When you cut a big log through in the middle and it's up off the ground when you cut it what will happen is this will go like this and pinch the bar and I'm now going to show you what you do to avoid that. I've stopped the saw and this gap because of the weight on either side and nothing underneath it is starting to close up. Now what you do at that point is get your, your wedge and drive it in and see the saw became loose again, not stuck anymore. Now one thing you've got to do is make sure that the tip of your wedge is not going to touch the saw when you start it. As you can see, it didn't jam the saw and I was able to cut right through with no problem. Now if I hadn't had that wedge in there, you get the bar jammed. If you get it jammed good and proper, you got to cut it out. And it doesn't do your bar or chain any good much either. Here we've got a big dead bloodwood. It's probably a couple of feet through at the butt and I'm going to fell it. And one thing I've got to be aware of is just over there, and I don't know if the camera will pick it up, there's a power line. Uh, it's probably leaning ever so slightly towards the power line. The head of the tree has got most of its weight out towards the power line. I really don't want it to fall that way. There's not a lot of weight at the top of it, however, it doesn't need much because it's on a big leverage. The first thing to do is decide the best place to let it fall and work out if it all goes pear-shaped what it could hit. And you do this with this piece of stick any bit of stick will do, just hold it up in the air. Hold your stick up in the air level with your eye and slide along it and have the top of your stick level with the top of the tree and your thumb down at the base of the tree. By laying the stick down you can see where the head of the tree is going to wind up and in this case I'm going to want to move that ute. Looking at this tree from another angle you can actually see that most of the weight is out this side. What I think I'm going to try and do is fell the tree that way parallel to the power line. There's not much wind so that's not going to be a big factor and I'll show you how I'm going to go about it. To give you some idea I'm going to cut a wedge shaped piece out of here then when I cut the tree off I'm going to cut it up above that wedge shaped cut and drive a wedge in it as I go. <laughs> Now I cut a wedge shaped piece out at first 
and it was nowhere near big enough. I just made a miscalculation. But as you can see now, it's cut through more than a third the way through the tree. And now the next cut from the back will be right up here. So we'll do that now. <laughs> The idea of this is so that the base of the tree doesn't skid back when it falls and hit the operator. Unfortunately at this point we had a bit of a miscommunication and the camera got turned off but I will cut another tree down and show you the final result. After that big hard tree it's time to sharpen the saw. First of all take my little stump vise that I got from Jono and Jono and drive it in the log and if you just follow what I do as I go along you should be able to give your saw a sharpen up in this field. After you secure your saw in the stump vise, make sure that the chain moves around freely. If you put the cutter bar too deep in the vise, it'll rub on the actual vise frame and you won't be able to turn the chain around. Whenever I do any work to my saw, I always give it a brush down and try and keep it clean. The sharpening out in the field, there are several different things you can use. Today I'm going to stick to basics and use a file but with that file I'm going to use a special guide that you can get in this kit and it's really good because it keeps the file in exactly the right position on the tooth of the saw. As long as you stick to the angles that are scribed on the guide things go pretty smoothly. The other angle you've got to consider is the up and down angle on the heel of your, of your file and what I always do is have it slightly down in the heel. This chain hasn't been sharpened before and you'll notice every now and again the file grabs a bit. The reason for this is that the gap between the raker and the toothed face is a little bit tight yet and as I file sometimes I just slightly catch the back of the raker. Once this chain's been sharpened a couple of times, that won't happen anymore. So just keep working your way around the chain and keep an eye out for where you started. If you're not sure at all, you can put a mark with a marker on the chain if you want to. I go by where the first tooth has been filed. I can see it because it's a lot shinier. So every second tooth is what you're filing now and obviously you're falling away from yourself and when we change to do the other side of the chain we are going to have to turn the saw around or go around the other side of the stump. This is the last tooth on this side that I filed and you can see the next tooth to be filed is shiny so we've got back to where we started. In the kit you get a raker gauge and what you do is you put that over the teeth and where the gap is if you put your little flat file on it and it files the raker down then they need filing but this doesn't have any effect on the raker so it does not need filing yet. I've completed sharpening one side of the chain so what I'm going to do is turn the saw around. I cannot get around the other side of the stump. I'm going to lift the chain up off the frame of the stump vise and tighten it up. This thing takes a bit of tightening with your thumb sometimes on a big saw and it might be a good idea to put a pair of pliers on it but don't overdo it and wreck your vise. So again it's exactly the same procedure as on the other side. Just stick to the angles that are scribed on your guide and go right round the chain till you get to where you started then check your rakers and then of course this chain's loose so we'll tighten up the chain and get ready fuel the saw up and we're ready to go again this is that big tree I cut down before and it's pretty well had it in the head it's all rotten and it's got bits of dirt in it from termites and it's not much good for anything I don't even know whether I'd cut it up for biochar, probably just wrecked me saw. One interesting thing that was in it was a huge wasp's nest and luckily the wasps weren't in there, it must have been abandoned and they didn't attack us. 
I'm now going to fell another dead tree and with a bit of luck we won't have trouble with the camera this time. That bar's 24 inches long so you can see the tree's probably 6 inches less than that. Probably an 18 inch tree. And these trees are proper hard. They've been killed about 11 years ago I think. Once I cut the scarf out, I'll cut round the other side and I'll cut much higher than the scarf so I get a step when I cut the tree through. I've got the saw a fair way in now and it's time to drive some wedges in. And once I get the wedges in and it's safe, I'll continue to do the back cut. As I cut in and weaken the tree, I'll keep driving the wedges in tighter and tighter to make sure the tree falls the way I want it to. You can see here I've got a nice step which prevents the base of the tree going back and hitting the operator, which is what I wanted. Thanks a lot for watching this edition of Farming Live Australia. We'll see you next time.